G'day and welcome to the Noob Sparrow Podcast, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to what is the world's best spearfishing dedicated podcast, or so we like to believe anyway. Today's episode is an absolute beauty. We are speaking with none other than Sven Franklin, all the way from Australia's hipster paradise, Melbourne. And now we haven't had anybody really on from Melbourne, and we've never really spoken about Melbourne, so we're going to learn all about the spearfishing in and around Melbourne, Port Phillip Bay, Wilson's Promontory, and Sven talks about three main species in his area, uh, the Yellowtail Kingfish, the Mighty Snapper, and also the King George Whiting, amongst a few other species along the way as well. We talk about conditions, when and where to go diving, and what uh, what turns his area on, what makes it work, and a few of the issues he had to overcome as a new diver. He's only been going for a year, but he's joined up with a great club down there called Club Spearfish, and uh, he's having, a, uh, have, having an absolute ball, and has got plenty to talk about today. All right, now, before we get stuck into it, um, I just want to say a big g'day to the guys at Phillip Island Dive Club. Now, Zach, uh, he sent us a message uh, earlier on. Uh, He said, love your podcast and the guests you get on. We have a small community of hack spiros on Phillip Island known as Dive Club, an unincorporated, disorganized, ragtag bunch of dudes that love beers and talking spears on a Friday night at our local back beach. Sounds awesome. Some, uh, Some more Aussie guests and industry types would be great, but we aren't complaining about the great international guests. Would love to get a shout out for Travi No Show, Dave the Right Arm of the Lord, Al in Search of Redemption. He lost a 15 kilogram kingy recently at Wilson's Prom, and Vern the Kiwi Prez, and our long suffering partners. Keep up the awesome work at Noob Spiro. It keeps me sane during the regular blowouts down here on the Bass Coast. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Zach. That is, uh, that's an, I'm glad you guys are getting into your spearing and sounds like an awesome little club you've got going on down there. Also, g'day to Brendan Caldazzo. Uh, thanks for your message, mate, and we will work on getting you a kayak spear fisherman expert. And I think the best place there to look would probably be California. So we'll see if uh, we can reach out to some of our Californian uh, listeners and hopefully get a good kayak spear on the show and uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about kayak spear fishing. Um, cheers for the heads up. Now, as for the Kickstarter campaign that you everybody was so gracious about getting behind, um, where are we at? Well, currently we are just sourcing some artwork uh, for some of the advertisements to go into the book. So a big thank you to everybody that uh, purchased advertising to help fund the book. Um, we are currently... Uh, finalising that step of the project and from there we will look at uh, getting this thing printed so um, still moving forward with that and uh, pretty excited about that indeed all right well that's all from me let's get into today's episode all about spearfishing in the melbourne area with none other than sven franklin Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Get a couple of books that Turbo and I are both like. The Tim Ferriss books, uh, 4-Hour Workweek and The 4-Hour Body are both available. I also like the look of uh, Undisputed Truth by Mike Tyson. Now check that out at audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. I just want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Adreno. You can find them at spearfishing.com.au. They are one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores and stock every piece of spearfishing equipment you could ever imagine. They've got three locations, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. So go and check them out in store. But if you are shopping online, save yourself some money. Use the Noob Spiro code at checkout to save $20 on all purchases over $200. So that is at spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro at checkout. G'day guys, thanks for listening to today's Noob Spiro podcast. We're joined from sunny old Melbourne, 
Uh, it's about 8 p.m. there at night, I believe, with, for, with long-time listener Sven Franklin. He's uh, got on and backed the Kickstarter early like a ch- an absolute bloody champion. Welcome to the show, Sven. How's it going? Now, Sven, you're a, an inner-city Melbourne jeweller come Spiro, and I'm pretty excited about this because Shrek's actually getting pretty serious over there in China with a, with a young lady. So uh, after the show, we might have to uh, do a little bit of ring shopping with you, and uh, that's that's pretty, uh, pretty bloody exciting. But um, before we get into that, Sh- uh, Sven, why don't you tell us how long you've been spearing and how you got into the sport? Um, just over a year now. Oh, I know that because you wrote a letter, uh, 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 you wrote a story for the noobspiro.com what I learned in my first year spearfishing. You've had a better start than a lot of guys, though, Sven. How, how did you get started? Um, well, I got taken out with this one mate of mine. Um, he's bloody useless. He's the type of person that'll, that'll look at the sky and be like, oh, it's overcast. There's no point going out right now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he just he took me out and... Um, Splashing away, didn't expect much on, you know, scuba fins and a mask and enjoying myself and I dived down and I didn't even know how to equalise. He was um, trying to tell me the easiest way to equalise was just to breathe all the oxygen straight out of my nose while I was under the water. Um, started doing that, <laughs> running out of breath pretty fast. And yeah, just had a, had a little leather jacket swim in front of me and just kind of managed to whack it with the little pole spear and um i was pretty pretty hooked after that all right sven i thought you had a glamour start so that doesn't sound like a glamour start you had crappy old scuba fins and a, and a terrible mask i'm surprised you managed to shoot anything but that measly leather jacket was enough to get you hooked to what, what did you see some some cool stuff or i mean what what got you the bug what gave you the bug I don't know. I think it's just that hunter gatherer. I'm a man type feel kind of surging through the veins there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even have a catch bag on me once I got that fish. I chucked it off on the rocks, and when I came back to the rocks, it was gone. So I don't even know what happened to it. Oh no. So you're down in Melbourne, Sven. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the conditions? I mean, I know nothing about uh, spear fishing in Melbourne, you know, or let alone the um, lower states of the country. Um, what's your go-to fish? What, what's your target fish that you're primarily hunting down there in Melbourne? There's a few. The main one everyone wants is, you know, the good old snapper. There's a few different locations you can go to. You've got two different sort of bays that you can go to that run throughout pretty much the whole of Melbourne. One of them does, Port Phillip Bay. And then you've got Western Port on the other side, which hasn't really been explored much by many people. And if they have, they keep it pretty hush-hush. It's pretty dirty waters in there. And then you've got your uh, back beaches. But I find in Melbourne, it's it's a very popular sport in the summertime. Um, We're talking sort of between 22 to 19 degrees. Okay. Um, but come winter time, it, no one's in the ocean. It's about it reaches a low of nine degrees. Oh, but yeah, I, the biggest thing everyone's after summertime is definitely the yellowtail kingfish. Everyone's always after getting a good snapper as well, and uh, crays. Everyone goes pretty crazy for um, getting uh, the crayfish down here. Okay, so. Let's look at Port Phillip Bay. Say you're, you're spearfishing in Port Phillip Bay, you're looking for productive ground. Um, what are we looking for in Port Phillip Bay? Is it, you know, large expanses of weed bed? Is it primarily sandy? Are you looking for, um, you know, bommies or coffee rock? What's the uh, what's the sort of structure you're looking for um, that's productive down in Port Phillip Bay? Uh, yeah, you mainly want to kind of go to an area that's got a lot of ledges. Um, I find the ledges normally hold the best amount rather than your sort of um, grassy weed beds and things like that. Um, When you start to find that sort of rocky terrain, it's generally where you start to come across your little, like we've even got a fish down here called like rockling and they live in like little, little caves and things like that. And kind of just start to see more of the tastier table fish around those areas. Yeah, okay. I've always been interested uh, in whiting. I know Melbourne's famous for King George whiting. Can you tell us a bit about those? King George. They're, me personally, I'm really bad at hunting them. Um, they're, they're a bit of a flighty fish, so you've really got to have really good bottom time and just 
hold down for well over a minute just to get them to come in. Um, but you've you've got to have like a pranger head on your on your spear really to get them. Uh, you can get them with you know just a normal spear, but um, they're such a slimline fish that missing them is really really easy. Okay, yeah, and yeah, how yeah. do they show and up? Are they a large schooling fish? They show up on mass, or what's the go? You will see them in a mixture. Um, so you will definitely see them in schools in some areas, but in some some cases, I've come across like the odd two or three that are just sitting on on like a gravel bed, um, and you they blend in quite well. Um, so you'll only just sort of notice them as you're swimming, looking down below. And is that what you're looking for, a gravelly bottom when you're on the surface? Um, normally grassy. They they love the grass, but um, yeah, I think I've, I've kind of seen them in a few different... You, you'll see them all around in all the different sort of terrains, but grass is definitely their most favourite. All right. I want, I want to take us back to the start. So after... The, <laughs> no, you're all right. After this guy um, took you out on your first dive, I mean... Where did you go to from there? You got the bug. You decided you liked hunting, you liked gathering, you liked shooting stuff. How, how, what were your next steps? Um, next step from there, um, I was pretty fortunate to live two minutes away from Adreno. So I walked in there and um, just befriended one of the staff members named Oscar and he kind of just ran me through everything, told me what was what. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I got the heads up to kind of look into the um, the clubs that we've got down here. Um, and so I ended up a few days later going along to a club meeting for Club Spearfish and, um, yeah, just met a whole bunch of amazing sparrows there and they kind of took me under their wing and kind of showed me the ropes and told me what was what and, yeah. All right, so tell us a little bit about Club Spearfish. I mean, uh, how, many, how many people are in the club? I think at the moment we've got like an active sort of 50 to 60 members. Um, we've we've got like some members that, um, you know, float in and out, some like lifetime members who kind of started up the club and, you know, they're your sort of VIP members. Yeah, um, yeah. But no, they're just, it's, everyone's just kind of brought together by the love of spearfishing. So you've got, you know, you've got people who wear suits all day that are becoming great mates with, you know, your Aussie tradies. It's, you know, different worlds coming together literally for the love of just getting in the water and, yeah, going for it. Yeah, wicked. Wicked. So you got a diverse bunch of blokes in there and good and a good club culture. You guys do a lot of club dives and stuff? Yeah, we do. Um, I'm on the committee at the moment. That's actually one of my um, things that I organise is doing all the club dives for them. Um, so once a month we try to have a club dive, but, I mean, weather conditions down in Melbourne, it's four seasons in a day, so it can be uh, quite challenging <laughs> at the best of times trying to organise to get into the water. Um, and then once a year we do, like, a cool trip away somewhere. Um, so I think last month we went up to Eden in New South Wales, so that's about a seven-hour drive from where we are. Okay. Um, and there's a good crew of about 15 of us. Yeah, you just get away and get to know each other a bit better and have fun. Yeah, yeah, and horse around. All right, so, like, just to tie back into where Turbo was at, talking about Melbourne conditions and that, in the club, do you guys organise boat dives or is it mostly shore diving um, within that port? It was Port Phillip Bay, was it? Yeah, uh, Port Phillip Bay is um, generally uh, sort of... Um, shore dives. A lot of a lot of Melbourne is shore diving. Uh, it's not a place that you essentially need a boat. Um, there's only one point which is called Wilson's Prom where it's pretty essential to have a boat to hit the spots there. Uh, okay. That's where you've got like a whole bunch of different islands and things like that. Um, that's kind of that's a hot spot for getting like your kingfish, for instance. So having a boat makes that a lot easier than doing a shore dive on the back beaches trying to flash for them for hours and hope that they swim your way yeah yeah, yeah. all right so what, what were your what were your obstacles getting started what were the things you struggled with the most um like everyone else it's always finding a dive buddy um that's always a bit of a challenge and kind of just learning the weather patterns things like that 
when the conditions are good, it's quite easy being an enthusiastic newbie that you want to jump in the water whenever you can, the sun's out, but you don't understand the wind's blowing, say like a southerly, and then the water's filthy and you know, you're too excited, you jump in and you can't even see past the end of your spear gun. Okay, so southerly makes the water dirty there, not a, not a northerly. Northerlies we love. Yeah, um, o- offshore. South- yeah, southerlies are the worst. And what about seasonal variation? What sort of conditions brings in the cleaner water um, to your part of the world? I kind of find that um, wintertime brings in the better conditions. Uh, I find, like I'm normally in the water at least three times a week, but I find in wintertime I'm actually probably getting more dives in I mean, we'll definitely get some days where in summertime the water is just crystal clear, which is quite rare Um, because normally we're diving between five to eight metres max, so it's quite dirty. Um, But in wintertime, I find that the winds kind of play more to our favour. Yeah, okay. I know, um, sort of interested to know what sort of depth... um you're primarily spearfishing and like what's sort of ideal there um, in, down in Melbourne. So I know in Queensland they say that we, we dive a lot deeper than they do, say, down in Sydney to get fish. Um, it's generally not as deep. Uh, is it shallower again down in Melbourne or, you know, what's what's the story with the um, with depth and spearfishing down there? You can hit some really good fish in three metres of water. So we are a lot uh, shallower than you guys are for sure. Um, if we're diving deep, we're hitting 14 to 16 metres. It's still quite it's still quite challenging when you're starting, though, 14, 16 metres. You're talking 50 feet of water. It's still it's still quite – it's not an easy when – you, when you're getting started, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. So we've spoken about some of your more popular species, the snapper, um, kingfish, and the whiting. I just wanted to know, seasonally – Wise, when do your yellowtail kingfish start to show up in any sort of good number? They normally turn on sort of mid-December. Um, this year we had a bit of an early stint where um, one of the guys in the club actually got one mid-November. Um, oh, they're still around at the moment, but the numbers are dropping off um, and they're slowly making their way up towards New South Wales. Okay, that's kingfish. What about snapper? When did the snapper start showing up? So snapper, they're kind of here all year round. Um, They tend to be that one fish that everyone talks about having a season, but it always seems to be snapper season. So, I mean, wintertime, I find them easier to hunt in wintertime because they're a bit more sluggish and and everything than they are in the summertime. Um, But in sort of... When was it? I think the last couple months it was like their breeding time. So then that was technically snapper season. So you can shoot them all year round, basically. But you at, can pretty at, much, yeah, yeah. At certain times of year, they're a little bit more hotter than other times, sort of. Sort of. Yeah. All right, Sven. What about the famous King George Whiting? It's one of the best table fish in the sea. If we want to shoot a King George Whiting, when should we head to Melbourne? Um, I've probably had best success in finding them in the warmer months um they are here all year round as well i find a lot of the fish the only fish that isn't here all year round is the kingies um, uh, okay but everything else does hang around all year round all right so if i can boil down hunting whiting so it's a fairly shallow dive with a big static breath hold sort of hanging around the weed beds and just waiting for those fish to come into you yeah, literally, um, you could be in four metres, dive down, and just sit there and just wait. Normally, for King George, you've got to be on the bottom for about a minute for them to start coming into you, um, for, for the schools of them. So it's really just pushing that breath hold, and just the same thing where you're avoiding, you've really got to avoid your eye contact with them. Um, kind of look out the corner of your eye if you can, and yeah, You can literally have a school coming right up to you, and as soon as you make one little bit of eye contact, that's it, they go back, and then you've got to wait even longer for them to come back in. Right, and do they um, respond well to, say, like a burley? Is there a burley that you can use for them, or do you use, like, um, dusting up the sand on the bottom? Is that a method that works well for whiting? Is there any sort of secret tip you can give us? Um, None that I'm actually aware of myself. Um, I don't know, burleying isn't really a big thing down here. I don't, 
I find no one really does burly down here in Melbourne. I mean, we don't have the sharks like you guys do up in Queensland, so. And and it, and even if you do have sharks, you've only got five to eight metre visibility, so you don't see them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's bloody good. All right, memorable fish, Ven. What's, uh, what's one of the most memorable fish you've taken in your first year spearfishing? I saw a cracker photo with that kingfish in your in the story you wrote on noobspiro.com. Is that still your most memorable fish to date? Yeah, that that would probably be. Um that was that was a nice fifteen keg king. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, no, that was that was pretty awesome. That was out at Wilson's prom. Yeah. Um we're heading out on the boat and pretty much um the whole time, the whole morning you know, I'm talking it up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail a 15 kg king. I'm gonna nail a 15 <laughs> kg king. I'm just getting shit left, right, and centre from everyone. Um, and we ran into a few of the guys, and they'd already landed some. And they told us what spot to hit. So we started driving up there, and then the sounder just started going nuts. So we just rolled straight off the back of the boat, um, and. Adrenaline just starts kicking in. You can't hold your breath. You're trying to load your gun. You're trying to do everything. And um, as I dived down, one of my mates um, nailed one. And as he did that, it kind of spooked the school off. And so I kind of swam over to him. And then there's float lines getting mixed up everywhere. And he's asking for um, a second shot. And anyways, one of the guys hands him... um, just grabs a gun and hands it to him, loads it, um, and then as he passes it to him, he's already kind of landed his fish, he's got it in his hands, and he just drops that gun and lets it sink to the bottom of the ocean because he thought it was attached to a uh, float line. So there there went my gun for the day. Uh, <laughs> that was fun. Um, anyway, so we hop back onto the boat, and um, this time I've kind of got my, uh, my mindset right, and they came straight back on the sounder and so I rolled straight back off the boat again, uh, load my gun and then as I'm diving down, there's a school of about 60 plus kingfish that just roll straight through. Oh, wicked. Um, I probably only went down to about eight metres deep and as I started to level out, um, I noticed they were starting to swim away from me on like a 45 degree. So then um, I just started making some grunting noises in the water and it just sparked their interest and they just came straight, straight towards me. Um, and then I just kind of out of, I don't know, the 15 fish that were straight in front of me, I just looked for the very biggest one and just plugged them right behind the, uh, the fin. And that was it. Just played them up really slowly and, and yeah. And then when my mates, um, came back onto the boat with theirs, they all threw a hissy fit because I managed to get a 15 kg king and theirs were tiny. <laughs> so you, you talked it up on the way out and you actually managed to get one. That's never happened to me. Every time I ever talk it up, I never shoot anything. Oh, can't believe it. Well done, Sven. Oh, I get a lot of, I got a lot of flack for that these days. Um, like, the boys went out the next weekend and then I just got all these photos of the kingfish that they had got and the whole time they're trying to tell me that my kingfish is bigger than your kingfish and <laughs> Ah no, good good story. Good fish. Yeah, there's nothing like it when a um a plan like that comes together for you. Is that a big kingfish for your area? Um that's on the bigger side. Um I feel the real big ones are between your 70 to tw- uh, 17 to 20 kg mark. Um, I don't really know personally of any that are really much bigger than that that have been taken. Yeah, well, that's an, uh, that's an awesome fish for down there. Sven, we've spoken about uh, kingfish, whiting, snapper, um, hunting techniques for those fish um, out of order. Just re- That really gets under Shrek's skin, but I couldn't help myself. Um, mate, is there any other fish down there um, that you'd want to speak about in the Melbourne area? I, I, um, I, I wanted to be a bit more specific. Sven, you, you shot a good black drummer the other day, and up in Queensland they're a bit snobby with black drummer. People tend to think they're a rubbish fish. But down there in the cold water they actually taste much better, I believe. Um, are, are they a difficult fish to hunt? Oh, they're super easy. <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, 
We all laugh, but like when you first get in the water, unless someone spoon feeds you a fish, you, you really you don't have much chance of shooting anything unless you're just a natural. Black drama are, are good because they kind of they live in caves and things. So like one of the best. Well, one of the most fun hunting techniques I kind of find down here is to, um, you've got like a, you know, a torch on you and you're diving and you're just kind of looking in caves, left, right and centre. Because um, normally in the caves, that's where you'll find your drummer or your rockling. And then you'll even get your odd um, surprise sometimes when you're looking and you'll just see these feelers of these craze that are there. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's quite yeah. a, a fun I mean, it, it destroys your breath hold because you're up, down, up, down, up, down, but um, it's still a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're just up, down, up, down, looking in these caves, and you and you get rockling, um, drummer, and, and every, occasionally the odd cray. Do you also get abs down there? Yeah, we do. Uh, we get two different types of abs. Uh, we've got your green lip and your black lip. So the green lip um, aren't as common to come across, and you're only allowed to take two per person. Um, and only on a weekend. And same with the black abs. You're only allowed five per person um, on the weekend. So you literally cannot take them midweek? No. There's only one part of Victoria, I believe, that you're allowed to take them outside on a weekday. What's the rationale behind that? Um, I think it's just to help the numbers in them. Um, I mean, there's plenty of them around, but... In the summertime, um, there is an open period where it's kind of through the Christmas, New Year's break where it's kind of two, week, two weeks straight where you're allowed just to kind of go for them. You've still got your limits um, of five but per the- person, but I feel like in summertime, everyone just smashes them because they're quite easy to get. <laughs> so it's just an open slather for two weeks. And everyone just hooks in, gets in on. Pretty much. Oh, uh, winter time is the best because that's when you've got your dedicated sparrows in the water. And it, it just that's when all the fish life kind of comes back because the fish get super flighty because everyone just shoots at them and it kind of just makes it a bit more challenging um, in itself. Ah, well, um, everyone's got a different... They've got all these different fisheries method. I, I, I'm guessing they did it with some consultation with the recreational guys, so what, what, whatever's working to, to help the abalone fishery stay strong, I guess. And, and by the sounds of it, it's working. Oh, I was at the airport the other day, and they sell like two abalone for over three hundred dollars. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, this is the thing: supply and demand. There's, there's, they're not, they're not um, allowing the, they're, they're managing the fishery that hard now that no one can get them anywhere. So, the price has gone right up, which I suppose is a good thing for abal- uh, commercial abalone divers. All right, Sven, what about a um, tougher situation for you? You've only been going a year, but have you had any near misses so far? Um, the worst one would have been a mate of mine. He, there's this spot that he kind of came across. He'd been to it once, and um, we were racing there straight after work to try and get in the water before you know the sun went completely down, and it was a bit of a bush bash to get there. It's about an hour and a half of a bush bash, and he managed to take us the complete wrong way. Um, so it turned into about a three-hour bush bash. Um, by the time we actually got down there, we were exhausted, carrying all our gear and everything. Um, and when we got in, the conditions were rubbish. It was so strong. Um, the current was just sucking us straight out. The swell was too high. Um, we're just getting rolled Um around in the water, got holes in my wetsuit and my gear's just getting bashed and it just, yeah, just reached a point where we just kind of pulled the pin because it was getting a bit too hairy for us and had a really sad, wet, cold sort of hour and a half bush bash on the way back home. <laughs> yeah, where well, when you're new and you've, and you've got that stoke, um, yeah, I remember when I started up in Bundaberg and it would just take a small breeze um, in close and the water would just be pea soup, but I just couldn't help myself. I had to get down in the water, check it every day, you know, just to see if that viz had come good so I could get in for a dive and just I was way too eager. Is that sort of the same thing you went through? Yeah, it's way too eager. Yeah, and it's just <laughs> so disappointing every time you get out, get down in the water and it's just... Uh, it's just so dirty, but you can't help yourself. You've got to get in and have a, have a look about and see if it's worth getting in. Yep. 
we've all we've all done it, and that, and that's why I guess you slowly learn how to forecast a bit. Um, Sven, have you have you um, kept a dive log at all since you started? Um, only on the good fish that I've come across. Okay. Um, for instance, there was a time I was out just in this real random spot. Um, I've got a few good fish there, but I've never seen anything, um, you know, overly exciting. And this one day, there just happened to be a thunderstorm rolling over straight the top of us. And um, then I just started seeing snapper popping up everywhere and then got schooled by a school of about 20 kingfish. Oh, wow. Um, So I quickly emailed myself with all the details and information that <laughs> night so i've got that i've got it all on on log but um yeah i'm starting to do that more with when i start seeing all the really good fish about um just conditions moons um tides all of that wicked you're onto something good there um line fishermen do it and uh noobs turbo and i've been riding one for a while now i'm actually going to send you the first the first copy we print um, it's just going into to the to the uh, to the formatter now, so I'm going to send you a copy when it's done, buddy. Awesome. The very first one. You can tell me what you think. <laughs> Where to find all the leather jacket? <laughs> leather jacket and King George Whiting plus plus. Uh, what was the other one we had? Black drummer. That was that was a good one. One of the most important aspects in spearfishing, particularly when you're hunting stealthily in a reef scenario, is remaining undetected. Now, there has been huge advancements by Hex Aquatic in wetsuit technology. They've created what is known as a Faraday cage in a wetsuit, which prohibits your electromagnetic signals from being emitted from your body. Now, this is something that marine animals pick up on and when you don't emit those you are just one step closer for not being detected underwater this is amazing technology and we encourage you to go back and check out our fantastic episode with warren bird from hex aquatic and we ask him the big questions on this technology so check out that episode and check out hexaquatic.com Uh, all right, let's move on to Veterans Vault now. We haven't organised, Sven, but I thought since your biggest struggle starting out was finding a dive buddy, and I think you have had a lot of success um, with this, we'd maybe just talk all about how to find a spearfishing dive buddy when, you, when you're getting started. What, what were the biggest wins for you for this? Um, biggest things were um, definitely finding a spearfishing club. Um, I know that's not accessible for everyone but there are pages on facebook um for instance down here in victoria we've got a victorian spearfishing facebook page um and new dudes pop up all the time asking for people to go out with them and people do respond yeah um and there's other pages like that that are slowly kind of popping up as well yeah um otherwise going into your local dive store Um, I found that helped. I mean, I practically lived in the dive store for... (laughs) I still practically live there. Um, (laughs) So I I dive with pretty much all the staff members there now um, just because I've spent that much time in there just racking their brains. um, And just eventually people do kind of get to know you that way. Um, And also found one kind of good thing that I, I do is um, I've always had the sort of mindset to be the best dive buddy that I possibly could be. Yeah. So I found that through doing that, um, that's actually made more people want to get in the water with me. Like guys from the club, for instance, um, you know, they know that I'm a conscious diver that's going to watch them when they're, you know, going up and down and, they know that I've, you know, gone and done a, a course to, you know, I know how to do shallow water blackout rescues and, you know, they, it kind of helps give them a, that bit of peace of mind. Um, yeah. yeah. That, you know, you, you know what you're doing and, and you are worth taking out. Ah, nice. So finding a, a, a dive buddy is also about being a good dive buddy. So, like, 
you, you also did a free diving course. So I, I'm aware of that from your article. What were some of your biggest takeaways from that um, and, 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 and learning how to be a good buddy? The easiest way to be a good buddy, um, always have food on you. Everyone always gets hungry. Uh, you're already my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, um, I'm renowned for packing sandwiches, protein bars, apples, grapes, like seven Gatorades, so every person's got a Gatorade, water, um, all of that. So that snakes, but, snakes are another winner with me, Sven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what else, Sven? What else about being a good dive buddy? So take food, uh, watch your mates' backs, get a good reputation for like you know you know how to watch guys' backs. Um, what, what else? What else makes a good dive buddy? Hydration. Um, I'm I'm quite renowned for there's like a little inner joke I guess with all my mates and they always give me shit for being on their cases about hydration but I find just making sure that everyone is hydrated um, I think it was Luke Potts that mentioned it with how much water you've got to drink per hour um, when you're out in the water and you'd be surprised your diving gets so shot when you are hi- um, dehydrated so. Like on on trips away and everything, I'll force my mates to drink a liter and a half before they go to bed, and then another liter and a half when we wake up on the way to the spot. Um, <laughs> and like, it, but it, it it works wonders though. It, they'll yeah. they'll come away from it and they're like, oh wow, I, you know, I didn't have any equalization problems because yeah, a lot of a lot of little things like that are all literally through just being dehydrated. Yeah, 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 yep. And energy levels is—it's all affected. And uh, I, I didn't realize that either until I was sp- speaking to Luke. And it's—it's uh, it's tied right into equalizing. Um, and you're starting to struggle halfway through a dive day of equalizing. A lot of guys think it's just oh my, you know, my membranes just sore from going in and out all day. But it's more to do with hydration than than anything. Yeah, good, good point. All right. Any last points there, Sven, for um, finding a dive buddy? So we got we had Facebook and going into a retailer and being a good buddy, bringing food and watching people's backs. We've just talked a bit about hydration. What else? What else for being a good buddy? How do you find buddies? Um, just kind of see who's eager. I guess that kind of makes people stand out. Um, you've got some people who will make up every excuse under the sun, but when you do find someone that's eager. Um, I mean, even if they're not quite up to your skill level, you can still take them out and show them the ropes and and you'll be surprised at how much people are willing to learn. So don't always discount the guy that, you know, is new because we've all had to start there. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, oh, good. Let's move on to funniest moment. What's the uh, what's one of the funniest things you've experienced so far spearfishing? Um, funniest moment would be... Probably, um, I was out diving for Listen, some craze with. I was going to say listening to Turk, to, uh, listening to Shrek talk about membranes, but no, no, <laughs> it's, it's good. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, insane in the membrane. That's what they call me. No, so sorry, sorry, Sven, I interrupted you. Something You're about cr- crayfish tail. Uh, yeah, no, I was diving for craze with um, with one of my mates and. We're doing the good old up, down, up, down, just looking for them. And he manages to come across one. And um, he's not sure if he can reach it. So I had to dive down and I managed to find another entrance. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, try look at it from this point And I'm sure you could grab it. And then he said, all right, I'm going to go down. I'm going to grab it. And um, on your way, once I'm down there for a little bit, dive down and, and kind of if it moves back too far, maybe you should just grab it yourself and just pull it straight out. And so he's down there, he's wriggling about, and so I decide to pop down, and I can see the back of this cray, and it's pretty much walking into the back of my hands. So I grabbed it by the tail, and I'm trying to pull it out, and it's a bit of a struggle, and I managed to rip it out, and um, I'm starting to swim up with it, and the look on his face, apparently he had it in his hands the whole time, and I just ripped it straight out of his hands. So you, you went from talking about being a good buddy to, to, to being the to opposite. being a bad one, uh. yeah. <laughs> 
Trek, you know me, I love to pretend to read. <laughs> and even more than that, I love glossy images. And that's exactly what you get with Spearing Magazine. It's our favourite spearfishing magazine from Jeremy Gamble, uh, our guest on the Noob Spiro podcast. It's an absolute ripper and he's got a great deal for listeners here in Australia. That's right. You can get the whole back catalogue for 60 bucks Australian. If you're if you're down south, if you're down under, and, and we'll include the South Africans in that Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Love it. You, you can email Jeremy Sales at spearingmagazine.com and secure the whole back catalogue for 60 bucks. Jeremy, put this together just to help help us people down here overcome the uh, cost of shipping. So get hold of 19 issues of this top quality magazine for 60 bucks. All right, Sven, Melbourne dive bag. What are you diving with down there? What, what's your equipment from head to toe? I'm in a five mil all year round. Um, that keeps you nice and nice and warm. Um, just in the Rob Allen wetsuit. Um, I'm on some carbon blades. Okay. Um, just some nice dive bars. Okay. Um, they, they work quite well. Um, yep. In terms of mask, I actually struggled to find a mask. Um, I tried on literally over a hundred masks, and out of the store, there were only two that fit my face. Oh wow! Um, so it's the Oceanic Mini Sub. I haven't heard of the Oceanic Mini Sub. Is that like what's the cost? Um, what's the, I think a, it was about one twenty. Okay, all right. So on the more expensive end, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit bit annoying because um, I wanted to do the whole GoPro mount on on the top of it, where you can just kind of drill through and everything, but. Um, Pretty much the whole mask is just silicon, so you can't even do that on it. Okay, all right. I've got a one meter Rob Allen, um, but I've put a mini sub roller head on it, which was a lot of fun to do. Um, it's quite good. Did you, you use, to learn how to? Did you use Turbo's video on YouTube to do that? I saw his video, um, <laughs> but no, sadly not. I didn't didn't <laughs> didn't listen to his advice on it. <laughs> so he did it the hard way. Did it the hard way. All right. um, but it's good. You get to learn to tie all, all the um, knots and everything and actually learn how to rig up a gun for yourself, which is, I don't know, I reckon that's well worth learning. Um, yeah, for kinda sure. kind of saves you relying on other people to do it. Which is what I do. Yeah, I saw your roller. It was an absolute mess. I've never seen anything like it. There was bloody rope and string and shit coming off it everywhere. And that was right before you went to New Zealand. Um, so we had a bit of a sit down and we watched uh, my video together, sorted it out. I, I actually like that video you made, Turbo. You, you laid it out pretty well, the conversion there. But uh, I didn't do mine that way, unfortunately. And, and I think there is definitely some advantages to rigging your own gear. You know exactly, you know how you can change things if you don't quite like things and all the rest of it and in the long run it it, it, it serves you well i think and a point taken I, I will start spending a bit more time on my own uh gun rigging that's for sure all right sven what out el- what else you got so you're running a one meter rob allen with an mvd was it mvd uh, head on it? Manny, Manny oh, Manny sub. Sub. oh good that's even better yeah okay. cool. Um, cool he's just released the new ceramic head as well i want to know how good that is he's got some other things in development too yeah, he's been uh, he's been busy, old Manny. Um, apparently, there is a, a definite difference um, with the ceramic bearings. I know Chris Coates did a lot of work and testing um, on that, and he favoured the ceramic bearings. And now Manny's got them in his heads, which is um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, yeah, so pretty interested to see how um, how popular they are and how, and how they go. All right. So, what about fl- floats, foot pockets, knives, all the rest of it? Um, knives, I just run Mac knives. I just find they're just great blades. Um, can't seem to fault them. Um, in terms, I normally just run a 20 metre float line. You don't really need anything longer than that down here. Um, in terms of the float, I've just got like a pro blue sort of 15 litre float. You don't need anything for big game fish down here, um, even the kings that you're getting or the tuna that you'll shoot, uh, we get tuna running through every now and again. Um, but they're so small that you don't need anything. You don't need like a couple atmosphere float or anything to stop them. Foot pockets, uh, Marias, running the Marias pockets. Um, they're nice and comfy. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's about it. 
All right. What's what, what's one of the biggest things you've struggled with from with equipment, and uh, and how did you rectify it? Have you had any dramas with gear? Um, I actually had my <laughs> out of all the things, learning rigging. Um, you guys posted up about having knots pull through on roller guns, and the day that you guys put that up, um, my knots pulled through all through my roller guns. Ah, so did you change over to the diamond knot? I don't know the name of the knot. Um, it's a lot thicker, though, than the sort of standard knot that they tell you to roll uh, to make for it. It's like three times the size of it. So, so you would have started just with a granny knot, uh, sorry, an overhand knot, and then um, it's it's seems to be what everyone recommends, and then you've gone to the diamond knot where you sort of make a ball with a loop on the end? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. And how's that um, been for you? How's that working? Oh, it's been ace. It's solid. Turbo the knot, turbo the knot geek. Far out. Look, mate, I'm, I'm just making a difference in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> Four years of toil, uh, and um, finally we've, uh, uh, we've changed someone's life. Far out. I love hearing you just explain knots. You sound like just a just a farm boy, which you are. So that's great. All right, let's move on to the Turbo's favourite section, Sven. This is the deep and philosophical Spiro Q&A. Right, here we go. Can you describe for us what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence or maybe two if you have to? Um, mainly it's just the freedom that it provides, just that sort of escape. Um, just everything else in the world doesn't matter. It's just you what's there in front of you, the ocean. I just feel that whole mindset that comes with it. It's just so relaxing and peaceful down there. You could Love it. live down there if you could. I can relate. All right. What's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Oh, time in the water. Time in the water is key. Um, you can have everything handed to you on a silver platter, but unless you spend your time in the water and you learn for yourself... Um, you're never going to get it. All right. Who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? Um, most influential would be a few of the guys from the dive club. Um, there's one in particular, a guy named Danny Hendricks. Um, he's an absolute gun. Um, you might have seen about this time last year, there was a video that went viral of a diver up in the Great Barrier that got rammed by a bull shark. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was him. Ah, oh, right. So... Eh? Yeah, he's um, he's he's got gills. That guy literally is out on his boat, searching for new grounds all the time, and he's just he's kind of the idolised in the club, if you will. He's the guy that all the the new guys always look up to and want to be like. So yeah, all he's right. definitely a big influence. All right, we'll have to get the all the guys in your club to pressure him to come on the New Spiro podcast, and uh, hopefully he will join us at some stage. But that's all good. All right, Sven, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? Um, probably wouldn't change anything, to be honest. Um, I think I think I'd, it'd be more just reassuring myself that everything that you want will eventually come. Um, there's no quick way to getting a big breath hold or a quick way to getting the big fish it's it just all happens over time um, and you've just got to take the steps to get there all right nice all right last question what is the single biggest lesson you've learned in your in your first year spearfishing uh biggest lesson is just not to take anything too seriously um you're gonna lose fish i've lost some fish and i've been so gutted about it um you're going to have days where you go out and you're not going to see anything um but it's it's the memories it's the experience you're out there you're making friends you're just seeing things i mean the whole day you might just see one big stingray but you're seeing a stingray and the rest of the world isn't you've really just got to take it all in and just realize that we're pretty privileged to everything that we're experiencing with it it's it's a whole other world and I mean, enjoy yeah, it. We're there with right. it, man. Be grateful. It's a good message. All right. So, can guys come and find you on uh, Instagram, Facebook? Where are you at, Sven? Online? Um, yeah, on Instagram. Um, I don't really post too much on there at the moment. Um, I'm pretty 
pretty bad at it, but yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I uh, pop up little things every now and again, little um, photos or spearfishing little clips that I'll make every now and again. And you're a, you're an active participant there on the Noob Sparrow community page on Facebook, so guys can come and chat to you in there. Um, look, some guys from Melbourne are no doubt going to listen to this show. How can they find Club Spearfish? Um, easiest way is to just jump on Facebook and type in Club Spearfish. Um, we have a club meet in Harlem um, at a place called Ocean Suits on the first Thursday of every month and normally kicks off at 7 p.m. Okay, cool. All right, that sounds good. All right, we'll link all this up in the show notes. So if guys pump in Noob Sparrow, Sven Franklin into Google, show notes will pop right up. Uh, Look, awesome chatting with you, Sven, and really, really, um, it's really nice chatting with you. Actually, I've I've wanted to talk to you since you um, got in contact with us. Uh, You've been a you've been a pretty staunch supporter. So um, really awesome having you on the show, man. Too easy. Thanks for having me. Keep the keep up the good work. Um, I know a lot of the guys down in Melbourne love listening to your podcast. So, yeah, keep it up. Cool, cool. If you've got someone uh, in the future to re- recommend us, uh, just just always, you're always welcome to drop us a line, buddy. Too easy. Awesome, Sven. Thanks for coming on the show, mate, and teaching us a little bit about the hipster spearfishing capital of the world, Melbourne. Looking forward to getting down there. Thanks, mate. All right, well, that's today's episode with Sven Franklin. I hope you got something out of this episode. I hope you learnt something about spearfishing in Melbourne. And uh, if you're in that part of the world, I hope this piques your interest and you take up spearfishing in Melbourne. So be sure to contact Club Spearfish Guys down there in Melbourne. Uh, the details will be up um, in the show notes. So check them out. Um, big thank you to Sven. What a wealth of knowledge. He's been going one year. He's, just, he's that keen and committed um, and he's gone about things the right way, and he's uh, he's learnt a, a great deal in such a short period of time, and it shows. Alrighty, well, next week, next fortnight, our episode will be with Chris Dillon. Uh, he's been on the show before. Uh, Chris Dillon loves shooting big pelagic fish. He's a, he's a hunter, and he loves shooting the big stuff. So we talked to him all about his upcoming project called Spear Junkies, and just exactly who the Spear Junkies are, where they're going, and what's on their target list. So it's going to be a really, really fun one, this one. Um, Chris is about to embark on a very exciting period in his life. Uh, He's got to leave pass uh, for one week every month um, for the next 12 months, and he's going to travel the world chasing some of the biggest and most revered pelagic sport fish in the world. So very exciting stuff from him, so be sure to check that out. Uh, Big thanks to Shrek for coming on the show and doing this interview with me as well so it's always good when shrek's involved he asks the good questions he's probably the best anchor man in the spearfishing podcasting business and that's that's not a light thing that's 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 a heavy burden actually so um big thanks to shrek all right that's it from me wherever you are in the world dive safe never dive alone and we'll catch you in a fortnight's time with chris dillon sometimes It's time to spend some money on yourself. And there's nothing like a new spear gun. That's right. Head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a big range of spear guns. Get tempted and read the customer reviews and really sort of have a look at what they've got to offer. Turbo and I love the Manny Sub roller guns. You can buy them at spearfishing.com.au. Go in and check out the spear guns. If you do decide to buy something, pump in the code NOOBSPEAR at checkout and save $20 on every purchase over $200. If you do have problems, they have a hassle-free returns policy, cheap shipping rate worldwide, and a price beat guarantee for Australia. You can also check out the stores in Brisbane, Sydney, or Melbourne and get help from more than 40 underwater experts. Online, they also have live help. You can talk to people online and ask any questions you might have about products. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a huge range of spear guns. Today's podcast brought to you by Audible. Now, you can check out uh, Audible. It's basically audiobooks. So if you like the Noob Spirit podcast, you're probably going to like listening to a book. So go to audibletrial.com forward slash noobspiro to get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial. Now, some of the audiobooks that Turbo and I both like are the 4-hour series by Tim Ferriss. Now, there's the 4-hour body, 
the four hour work week, the four hour shift, they're all good. His latest book is uh, Tools of Titans. It's unfortunately not an audio version yet, but definitely check out uh, the four hour work week. It's friggin' hilarious. I also would like to listen to The Undisputed Truth by uh, Mike Tyson. I think that would be a great uh, read. And also Bigger, Leaner, Stronger by Michael Matthews. It's a it's the simple science of building the ultimate male body and uh i definitely need that but uh you can check this out get a book for free uh just pump it in audibletrial.com forward slash noob give it a blast check it out support the noob podcast <laughs>